Okay, so we're in the last day of the 31 day challenge in March. Well, I thought it would be fitting that on the last day that we watch a video from Andrew Ang where he talks about AI agentic workflows. And at some point, uh, Autogen is supposed to be cited um, on one of the PowerPoint slides. So let's see. With AI agents, which I think is an exciting trend that I think everyone building in AI should pay attention to. And then also excited about all, all the other uh, What's Next presentations. So AI agents, you know, today the way most of us use large language models is like this, uh, with a non-agentic workflow where you type a prompt and generate an answer. And that's a bit like if you ask a person to write an essay on a topic and I say... So this is like uh, ChatGPT, you go to ChatGPT, ask it something and it comes back. Please sit down at the keyboard and just type the essay from start to finish without ever using backspace. Um, and despite how hard this is, LMs do it remarkably well. In contrast, with an agentic workflow, this is what it may look like. Have an AI, have an LLM, say, write an essay outline. Do you need to do any web research? If so, let's do that. Then write the first draft, and then read your own first draft and think about what parts need revision, and then revise your draft, and you go on and on. And so this workflow is much more iterative, where you may have the LLM do some thinking, um, and then revise this article, and then do some more thinking, and iterate this through a number of times. And what not many people appreciate is this delivers remarkably better results. Um, I've actually been really surprised myself working with these agent workflows, how well, how well they work. I'm going to do one case study. My team analyzed some data uh, using... Uh, so coding benchmark human eval. This isn't necessarily referencing Autogen, but remember we did something similar where they set up a human evaluation benchmark and they had a list of a hundred some functions. And then depending, you know, whatever model you wanted to use for that, it would tell you if the tests uh, were successful or not and give you output, um, which was like a benchmark for that, for those agents, for that model. Using a coding benchmark called the human eval benchmark released by OpenAI a few years ago. Um, but this has coding problems like Given the non empty list of integers, return the sum of all the odd elements around even positions. And it turns out the answer is you know, a code snippet like that. So today, a lot of us will use zero shot prompting, meaning we tell the AI, write the code and have it run on the first pass. Like, who yep. codes like that? No human yep. codes like that. We just type out the code and run it. Maybe you do. I can't do that. Um, so it turns out that if you use GPT 3.5, uh, zero shot prompting, it gets it 48% right. Uh, GPT-4, way better, 67% right. But if you take an agentic workflow and wrap it around GPT-3.5, say, it actually does better than even GPT-4. Um, and if you were to wrap this type of workflow around GPT-4, it, 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 it also um, does very and well. GPT and you notice that GPT-3.5 with an agentic GPT workflow actually outperforms GPT-4. Sorry, if you didn't hear that, he's saying 3.5 um, with uh, like using, basically using agents um, is doing better than if you were to go to chat GPT, use GPT-4, and then ask it the same question. Um, and I think this has, and, and this means that this has significant consequences for I think how we all approach building applications. So agents is a term that's been tossed around a lot. There's a lot of consultant reports talk about agents, the future of AI, blah, blah, blah. I want to be a bit concrete and share with you um, the broad design patterns I'm seeing in agents. It's a very messy, chaotic space. Tons of research, tons of open source. There's a lot going on, but I try to categorize um, a bit more concretely what's going on in agents. Okay, so something I just want to pause up right there. What he said about there's like a lot going on and it seems messy because there's so many um, frameworks. Um, I mean, for instance, I get asked a lot, what's the difference between what do I think about crew AI versus Autogen? Well, there's a lot of frameworks and a lot of tools that I assume he'll get into um, the tool use there. The fact is agentic patterns that he as he's going to get into, this is still relatively new, right? I know that, um, I know that also I get in comments about, you know, uh, where, what is an actual real world use case for this? And I... Honestly, I don't have an honest answer for that right now. I mean, I can use it for services, right? I can create a workflow that does something for me to make my personal life easier, right? For whatever, especially when I'm doing like videos or I'm posting or whatever it is. But something in like the other sciences, like how is it contributing to the world? You know, 
that is, I don't know how far we are there yet because there's still a lot of work to be done, right? This is still, like I said, this is still relatively new. There's a lot of work to be done and this will evolve in the future. Reflection is a tool that I think many of us should just use. It just works. Uh, to use, I think it's more widely appreciated, but it actually works pretty well. I think of these as pretty robust technologies. When I use them, I can you know, almost always get them to work well. Um, Planning and multi-agent collaboration, I think of it as more emerging. When I use them, sometimes my mind is blown for how yep. well they work. Yep. But at least at this moment in time, I don't feel like I can always get them to work reliably. So let me walk, walk through these four design patterns in a few slides. And if some of you go back and yourself will ask your engineers to use these, I think you get a productivity boost yeah, so quite still quickly. Emerging. So reflection, here's an example. Let's say I ask a system, please write code for me for a given task then we have a coder agent, just an LLM that you prompt to write code, to say, yo, def, do task, write a function like that. Um, an example of mm. self-reflection would be if you then prompt the LLM with something like this. Here's code intended for a task, and just give it back the exact same code that we just generated, and then say, check the code carefully for correctness, sound efficiency. Sorry, I just want to pause real quick. But so this is just using one agent. This is a single agent where it's doing something, and then it seems like, uh, we would then give it a prompt, give it the exact same code that just gave us, and say, "Hey, take a look at this again, and then make sure this is correct." And you know, the styling efficiency that he's talking about. Um, give me a different version of this if you think it can be improved upon to the same model. Construction code, just write a prompt like that. It turns out the same LLM that you prompted to write the code may be able to spot problems like this bug in line five, may fix it by blah blah blah. And if you now take his own feedback and give it to it and reprompt it, it may come up with a version two of the code that could well work better than the first version. Not guaranteed, but it works, you know, often enough for this to be worth yeah. trying for a lot of applications. Um, to foreshadow to use, if you let it run unit tests, if it fails the unit test, then why do you fail the unit test? Have that conversation and be able to figure out, fail the unit test, so you should try changing something and come up with V3. By the way, for those of you that want to learn more about these technologies, I'm very excited about them. For each of the four sections, I have a little recommended reading section at the bottom that you know hopefully gives more references. And again, just to foreshadow multi-agent systems, I've described as a single coder agent that you prompt to have it, you know, have this conversation with itself. Um, one natural evolution of this idea is instead of a single coder agent, two. you can have two agents where one is a We've coder used a critic agent, agent before. and the second is a critic agent. And these could be the same base LM model, but that you prompt in different ways. We say one, your expert coder, right? Code. The other one say your expert code reviewer has to review this code. Sorry, so if you can't see this, because um, uh, my big head's in the way, this is a critic agent. This is just another LLM that is a critic agent um, that we've used in other projects before with Autogen. And this type of workflow is actually pretty easy to implement. I think it's such a very general purpose technology for a lot of workflows. This would give you a significant boost in, in the performance of LLMs. Um, the second design pattern is to use. Many of you will already have seen you know, LLM-based systems uh, uh, using tools. On the left is a screenshot from um, uh, Copilot. Uh, on the right is something that I kind of extracted from uh, GPT-4. But you know, LLMs today, uh, if you ask it, what's the best coffee maker in your web search for some problems? LLMs will generate code and run code. Um, and it turns out that there are a lot of different tools that many different people are using for analysis, for gathering information, for taking action, for personal productivity. Um, it turns out a lot of the early work on tool use turned out to be in the computer vision community. Because before large language models, LMs, you know, they couldn't do anything with images. So the only option was that the LM generate a function call that could manipulate an image, like generate an image or do object detection or whatever. So if you actually look at literature, it's been interesting how much of the work um, in tool use seems like it originated from the so I'm not sure exactly what he means by this, but um, if there are, when I was researching Lava, for the video I did for Lava, and I actually was trying to give it like, hey, find Waldo in this picture. During my research, what there actually, there are actually other Python libraries that take that image, um, you, you tell it what you want to specifically search for on Waldo, like for instance, like the stripes of the shirt, and it can do either like, um, it'll it'll come up with like, 
like kind of a like a map of bits on on that image and say where there are more shadows or where there's like heat map kind of like a heat map or different portrayals of parts of that image and then like for instance shadows where there's not as much shadows because it found something similar to what you're looking for based on you know a bitmap of that image then it would return something for you now and that is like with a function you would pass the image in have it parse like the byte data from that image and then come up with this other kind of map like visual map so you can see what are the potential um place as Waldo is on the picture, right? So that was just an example. And I think that's what he's talking about. So before we were able for the introduced to like, um, image, like models that could uh, recognize it, and then, you know, give you some information about it, you know, they were using other libraries and functions that were um, giving information back. Vision because LLMs were blind to images before, you know, GPT 4V and, and, and Lava and so on. Um, so that's true use and it expands what an LM can do. Um, and then planning, you know, for those of you that have not yet played a lot with planning algorithms, I, I feel like a lot of people talk about the chat GPT moment where you're, wow, never seen anything like this. I think you've not used planning algorithms. Many people will have a kind of a AI agent. Wow, I couldn't imagine an AI agent doing this. So I've run live demos where something failed and the AI agent rerouted around the failures. So I've actually had Quite a few of those moments where, wow, you know, can't believe my AI system just did that autonomously. But um, one example that I adapted from the Hugging GPT paper, you know, you say, please generate an image where, the girl's read where a girl is reading a book and it poses the same as a boy in the image, example.jpg, and please describe the new image with the boy. So, give an example like mm -hmm. this. Um, today, with AI agents, you can kind of decide first thing I need to do is determine the pose of the boy. Um, then you know, find the right model, maybe on hugging face, to extract the pose. Then next, you need to find a post image model to synthesize a picture of a of a girl of, as following the instructions. Then use uh, image to text, to, and then finally use text to speech. And today, we actually have agents that I don't want to say they work reliably. You know, they're kind of finicky. They don't always work, but when it works, it's actually pretty amazing. But Okay, so first off, we did something like this, right? If you are following along in this, we, um, all these models, like, there's not like, there is a pose determination, but it's not like called a pose determination, like model. It's, it's one of the image models on hugging face, but we did something similar to this where we created an image from text. And then from that text, we put that into the whisper model from hugging face using an inference API server. And then it created a voice for us from the text describing the image. And, you know, we, we did that and created the MP4, right? But what I'm liking about what he's doing is he's not just saying, oh, this is amazing, right? Because while, yes, it's amazing, it's not there yet, right? Hon honest, the honest opinion is it's not there yet. Uh, we still, it, it can be, like you said, it's finicky, doesn't always work the way in your head that you want it to work. It's not quite there yet. It's getting there. And sometimes it does work the way you expect it to. It does. But, um, but then again, there are a lot of times where it doesn't. I'm happy he's like honest about that. So with agentic loops, sometimes you can recover from earlier failures as well. So I find myself already using research agents for some of my work where I'll want a piece of research, but I don't feel like, you know, Googling myself and spend a long time. I should send to the research agent, come back in a few minutes and see what it's come up with. And, and it, it sometimes works, sometimes does it, right? But that's already a part of my personal workflow. The final design pattern, multi-agent collaboration. This is one of those funny things, but uh, um, it works much better than you might think. Uh, uh, but on the left is a screenshot from a paper called... So that's chat dev. My very first video that I did with AI, because I did like other stuff before AI related to computer science. But when I kind of came back and was like, I need to change something up, I watched a video from AI Jason, if you know him. And so like last September, October or something, and he had a video using ChatDev, and then I went in um, and looked at it, and then looked at ChatDev, and then I did my own video, and that's kind of when I started my whole movement of, you know, my channel is now going to be AI development. And look, right there it is, Autogen. That's uh, the recommended reading right there, Autogen. Um, ChatDev. 
uh, which is completely open, which is actually open source. Many of you saw the you know, flashy social media announcement of demo of a Devon. Uh, uh, chat Dev is actually open source. It runs on my laptop. And what Chat Dev does is an example of a multi agent system where you prompt one LLM to sometimes act like the CEO of a software engine company, sometimes act like a designer, sometimes act like a product manager, sometimes act like a tester. And this flock of agents that you build by prompting an LLM to tell them, you are now a CEO, you are now a software engineer. They collaborate, have an extended conversation so that if you tell it, please develop a game, develop a Go Moki game, they'll actually spend you know, a few minutes writing code, testing it, uh, iterating, and then generate a like surprisingly complex programs. It doesn't always work. You know, I've used it, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it's amazing, but this technology is really um, yeah. getting better. And, and just one of the design patterns, it turns out that multi-agent debate, where you have different agents, you know, for example, it could be have ChatGPT and Gemini debate each other. That actually results in a, a better performance as well. So having multiple simulated AI agents work together has been a powerful design pattern as well. Um, so just to summarize, I think these are the, these are the, the, the uh, patterns I've seen. And I think that if we were to um, use these. So right now, you know, where, where my channel is, what I'm, what I'm doing a lot more, obviously, is multi-agent collaboration. Um, what I, I, I know, like, kind of like, right, I feel like we're in the phase right now where we're discovering what, um, what it is and kind of just like how to use it. And I feel like by the end of this year, going early into next year, whenever it gets a little bit more refined and we get a little bit better accuracy, you know, that also depends on the models, right? Um, then I think it's going to shift to instead of, oh, how do we use this? It's more of like, is it useful here and, and where can we use it, right? So it's, it's going to be more of the practical uses of using these uh, multi-agents more in the real world. Right, because I think right now a lot of us are trying. To, a lot of people are discovering this, kind of like when ChatGPT is like, "Oh, that's amazing." We just ask AI a question and it spits out something in seconds, right? So, kind of like in the same phase that he kind of mentioned, is personally just like, uh, maybe not like you, maybe not like you watching this personally. You're not, but as a whole, like like in the world, I feel like we're in this phase of, oh, now they're agents. What are these? How do we put these together? You know, how do we just get this to work? Right? There's all these frameworks that we can do, um, but. I think it's going to shift into, okay, now we know what it is, what it can do, where we're going to use it. These uh, uh, patterns, you know, in our work, a lot of us can get a practice to use quite quickly. And I think that um, agentic reasoning design patterns are going to be important. Uh, this is my last slide. I expect that the set of the tasks AI could do will expand dramatically this year. Uh, because of agentic workflows. And one thing that is actually difficult for people to get used to is when we prompt an LM, we want to respond right away. Um, in fact, a decade ago, when I was you know, having discussions around at, at, at Google on um, we call it a big box uh, search, we type in long prompt. One of the reasons you know, I failed to push successfully for that was because when you do a web search, you want to respond back in half a second, right? That's just human nature. We like that instant grab, instant feedback. But for a lot of the agent workflows, um, I think we'll need to learn to dedicate a task to an AI agent and patiently wait minutes, maybe even hours uh, to, for a response. But just like, I've seen a lot of novice managers delegate something to someone and then check in five minutes later, right? And that's not productive. Um, I think we need to, it, it'll be difficult. We need to do that with some of our AI agents mm -hmm. as well. I saw, I saw some laughs. Um, and then one other important trend, fast token generation is important because with these agentic workflows, we're iterating over and over. So the LM is generating tokens for the LM to read. So being able to generate tokens with- You know, this isn't the video for it. I'm not gonna get into um, Scrum Agile and some of the bad practices that managers, that I've been a part of that managers do in Scrum Masters. Um, but it's funny that he talks about the instant feedback because it's true. Like when you use chat GPT, right? You do get that. You ask it a question instantly. It's, um, streaming the response back to you, right? So that's streaming it. It's not waiting until it's fully done and giving it to you. It's streaming the response back. Whenever I use something locally, when I have like a local server running an open source LLM using, uh, you know, whatever, like LM studio, I just had an update about that yesterday, the other day. 
<laughs> it does take minutes. It takes minutes, and that's really because of a hardware problem, not because of a model problem. So there's a lot of things here um, about you know hardware. That's why I had a video on RunPod that I sometimes use if I want to use better models to give me better responses, and I want it done like you know quickly because it's hard when I want to create a text from image and on my computer it can take half an hour and it's still not done, right? I only have eight gigabytes. I only have eight gigabytes of RAM, so I just can't do things like that. So that's why some of these online services help you get past the hardware problem. But if you are in a real situation where you know you want a workflow to happen, you it can't be instant, right? Because it doesn't mean I know that's going to be faster than if humans did it, um, you know. But still, they got to take some time. So we have to be. He's talking about just being a little bit patient, and I agree with that way faster than any human to read. It's fantastic. And I think that um, generating more tokens really quickly from even a slightly lower quality LM might give good results compared to slower tokens from a better LM, maybe. It's a little bit controversial because it may let you go around this loop a lot more times, kind of like the results I showed with GPT-3 and an agent architecture on the first slide. Um, and candidly, I'm really looking forward to Cloud5 and uh, Cloud4 and GPT-5 and Gemini 2.0 and all these other wonderful models that many people are building. And part of me feels like if you're looking forward to running your thing on GPT-5 zero shot, you know, you may really get closer to that level of performance on some applications than you might think with agenting reasoning, um, but on an early model. I think I, I, I think this is an important trend. Uh, uh, and mm. honestly, the path to AGI feels like a journey rather than a destination. But I think this type of agent workflows could help us take a small step forward <laughs> on this very. You know, that's so funny. Um... I, how many videos I've seen the last few months where AGI is here, AGI happened, it's happening now, soon, like, you know, the next generation of models is going to be, you know, we're, we're achieving AGI. And I like the concept of it's more of a journey rather than like, well, let's just quickly get to the destination. It's just, uh, I just find that kind of funny because I, I've seen so many people talk about how it's here you know, with the next, um, the next open source, uh, AI software engineer that somebody created, you know, it, it's the journey, right? It's all about the journey. Long journey. Thank you. Well, I thought that was a good video to listen to, especially from Andrew Ng about what he thought with, uh, agentic workflow, because what I appreciate it, well, what I appreciated from him was that he was saying, you know, we're not really there just yet. They've done, you know, they have metrics, right? They have benchmarks. Um, you know, you give it, uh, you, you ask it a question to create some function and yet, you know, some models can perform better, you know, in an agentic workflow rather than just zero shot, which he talked about, but we're not quite there yet. Right. We're on the way there, right? We are trying and, um, you know, I think it might be, it's going to be a little while longer before it becomes more real and the use cases become more real for agentic workflow. Just my honest, just my opinion. We'll see, you know, but I hope you enjoyed the video. This is the last day. Obviously it's not the last time you're going to see me or that I hopefully see you. Um, but this is the last day for the challenge. Let me know in the comments, um, what you thought about this overall, give me honest opinions. I've learned a lot from this. I'll probably, I might even make a video in my response to what I've learned. Um, just from YouTube and gen just like from different things, right? So from YouTube, and from the YouTube perspective, what I learned, um, kind of how it works a little bit more from what the better responses were. I might go over all the analytics from all the videos so you guys can see what, what did better and what didn't do as well. Anyways, thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day and I'll see you next video.